Well, good evening, everyone, and welcome to another evening, a Sunday Night Thrive. Uh, I happen to be in Northern California at the moment, and so uh, I'm going to, I don't have the luxury, I'm sorry, at the moment to be able to do any singing, but at least I thought we could walk through the scripture as we continue to go verse by verse, chapter by chapter in the book of Leviticus, and I didn't want to leave you neglected because you were still in my heart, regardless of where I am in the world. And uh, I'm just really glad that we get this time. So let's go to the Lord in prayer and let's uh, see what the Lord has for us tonight. Would you please? Father, thank you so much for the opportunity to take this time and to be with you and to seek you out in your word and what it is that you have for us. So Lord, I, God, I just pray that you would redeem every moment of this time. Let it be rich and perfect time, God, I pray. And be blessed with our offering of the time we give you today. Lord, we pray that your word would grab a hold of us, and that we would be blindsided again by your great glory. Uh, just as we open your word, we expect to encounter you there, and we expect to hear from you. So Lord, immerse me in your Holy Spirit. Have your way, and let tonight be a perfect night. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, beloved. Uh, first thing, uh, let's jump into the word, and here's where we're at. I would start this evening as I would any by saying, please don't just believe me. Don't just assume it's true because I say so. Search the scriptures. Let the Bible have the final say. As I would say, don't take my word for it. Take the word for it. Yeah, that's right. All right. Uh, we are going into this evening the peace offering. And the peace offering is going to be fundamental in a lot of reasons. And, and it's not something that we really have an equivalent for in regards to a lot of our practice, it, the question really is, should there be? So let me kind of lay it out. The idea of a peace offering uh, uh, is something that actually God had laid out in Exodus chapter 20. After laying out the Ten Commandments, he will say, <coughs> excuse me, in verse 24, an altar of earth you shall make for me. You shall sacrifice on it burnt offerings and your peace offerings. And so he tells us that, that uh that God knows in laying on the commandments that this peace offering will be the product of our being aware of the commandments. And I think that that's really important to see those in that order. Uh, in chapter 24, uh, verse 4, Moses rises up and he does, what God, he does what God told him to. He builds an altar at the foot of the mountains with 12 pillars according to the 12 tribes of Israel. And then he sent young men who offered burnt offerings and peace offerings unto the Lord. Joshua, when they get into the promised land, uh, at the end of his life, when he's kind of like, who have I ripped off? Can we all testify that, I haven't, that I've done this right? And he'll say that if I've offered peace offerings on any foreign altar, well, let that be required of me. Let, that, let me require an account. That's Joshua 22, 23, which tells me that you can do this wrong as well. In 1 Samuel chapter 10, after the people had asked for a king and and if you remember, Samuel is very bent about the situation. And God says, no, 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 they haven't rejected you. They've rejected me. But if they do it right here, we could still be good. And then once that person is picked out, Saul, his name, Shual, which means to be sought after. Then we read what he was to do in verse 8, 1 Samuel 10, 8, when he says, you shall go before me to Gilgal. And surely I will come down to you and offer burnt offerings. Remember, that was our first of the three offerings. That's the one of total surrender. And make offerings or sacrifices of peace offerings. And so uh, we see, even in Saul's sanctification, this necessity of total surrender and sanctification, uh, which, by the way, Saul will never actually offer that sacrifice. And that really becomes fundamental to the whole story of Saul, the tragedy, if you will, of Saul, which is a guy with a fantastic calling but no consecration in his own heart. In 1 Samuel 13, when the Philistines are encroaching, now we're, we're chapters later, uh, and uh, at this point, now in the heat of this trial, Saul's like, you know, maybe I should have done that thing that we've done that I was supposed to do three chapters ago. And he says in verse 9, bring the burnt offering and peace offerings here to me. Now understand Samuel was the one who was supposed to be doing these. And Samuel said on this occasion as well, go down and then wait for me. Well, he went down and he waited for him, but apparently not long enough. And you know how this is. The problems are coming and they're coming hard and heavy. And 
we just we don't know how we can meet this and it, and so it just seems like the the drum the dramatic music is getting louder things are getting more tense people are freaking out more and more as are we and in that situation Saul's like forget it I'll just do it myself and and in that interesting and it can be easily missed it says you know, so he says, okay, here's the burnt offerings and the peace offerings, the burn of our total surrender and reliance on God, this peace offering of us having peace with God. And in that, it says that he got tired of waiting for Samuel. He starts to do these sacrifices himself. And it says, and he offered the burnt offering. But now what happened as soon as he had finished presenting the burnt offering, that Samuel came and Saul went out to meet him. And of course, he's going to be like, hey, I'm doing it just like you said. And Samuel's like, sit down and shut up. No, you aren't. It, the the easy thing missed is in context to where we're going to be tonight, which is that though he offered this dumb show of surrender to God, though he was taking the matters into his own hands, he never got to offer that peace offering, which is a celebration of his peace with God, because clearly at this moment, he has no peace uh, and no peace with God, nor for that matter, no peace of God. And we'll talk about that at the end. David, on the other hand, in 2 Samuel 6, 17, when the ark is finally brought into uh, the, the city of David, David is dancing madly before it as it's being brought in properly and had been tried to do it the wrong way, uh, the non-Levitical way, mind you. Uh, the first time in death ensued. Now here he is, he's doing it right. And as it is, it says he offered burnt offerings and peace offerings. And by the way, did you notice how the two seem to go hand in hand in all of these situations? Uh, David's son, Solomon, <coughs> in 1 Kings 3, uh, God speaking to him in a dream, what is it you really want, Solomon? And Solomon's like, I'm just a kid and I'm overwhelmed by the responsibility of leading these people before me. Could you please give me a, give me a wise heart? Give me wisdom. And God says, you know what? Because you didn't ask for vengeance on your enemies or great riches or honor, I'm going to give you those things too. And Solomon awoke, we read in verse 15, 1 Kings 3, verse 15. And indeed, it had been a dream. He came into Jerusalem, stood before the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord, offered up burnt offerings and offered peace offerings and made a feast for all of his servants. And here he is again going, Solomon, his heart saying, I am responding to peace with you by first giving everything up. I give it to you. And with that, then, uh, I'm celebrating the peace I have with you. In 1 Kings 8, the, the temple is built. And as the temple is built, part of that is he sacrifices 22,000 oxen. We'll see that here tonight. And 120,000 sheep as peace offerings. Uh, and it says then in 2 Second, Second Chronicles, the parallel text, if you will, for this, 7-7, uh, seven, seven, Solomon consecrated the middle part of the car, uh, courtyard, uh, which was in front of the house of the Lord. And there he offered burnt offerings and the fat of peace offerings. And that fat will become a key word here in a moment because the bronze altar which Solomon had made was not able to receive the burnt offerings, the grain offerings, and the fat. As a matter of fact, in 1 Kings 9, three times a year, Solomon would offer these burnt offerings and peace offerings on the altar which he had built to the Lord. Uh, and again, notice the burnt and peace as well. Hezekiah during his revival, and I'm almost done with this so we can get into our text. Uh, Second Chronicles chapter 30 at Passover, a revival is taking place. People are repenting. And Hezekiah gave encouragement to the Levites who taught the good knowledge of the Lord. And they ate throughout the feast seven days, offering peace offerings and making confession to the Lord of their, Lord God of their fathers. Uh, Hezekiah's son, uh, Menasha, the most evil king who would reign the longest, by the way. God gave him so long to finally repent. And as he finally repents at the end of his life in Second Chronicles 33, we read that he would uh, repair the altar of the Lord and sacrifice peace offerings and thank offerings on it. Ezekiel promises there will be a day when there will be this kind of opportunity again with proper priestage uh, in Ezekiel 43. But there's one last thing before we get into our text, and it'll go relatively quickly, just so you know. And that is that there are counterfeits. There will always be counterfeits, but this counterfeit is essential, essentially critical. And I want us to recognize that. Uh, in Exodus chapter 32, when the people have received the Ten Commandments and God says, we can celebrate peace with each other, I offer you that. Even in the, in the sight of the commandments, uh, the people, Moses being gone again, now, by the way, ultimately receiving 
the social law and then ultimately the plans for uh, having received the plans for uh, the tabernacle and the social law. It says that the people in 32.6 of Exodus uh, offered burnt offerings and brought peace offerings and the people sat down to eat and drink and rose up to play. And of course, that's the whole golden calf incident. So isn't it interesting that even as God lays out these standards chapters prior, now here the people are offering those two things, this idea of total surrender and this idea of, hey, God, we're good. This idea of, I have peace with you. And yet in that, they're actually committing spiritual adultery. They're, in, they're, like, they're sort of en route to that situation. To me, that blows my mind. And I think uh, Ahaz, King Ahaz in 2 Kings 16, will offer, sees this really cool altar in Damascus, has his piece of uh, prepare it, uh, a copy of it, and then he offers, of all things, peace offerings. It's like saying, hey, you know, I could do it kind of my way, however I want. And God, we're cool with that, aren't we? God is not. As a matter of fact, in Proverbs chapter 17, verse 3, we read of the impudent woman, the seductress, and we read that she caught this poor, dumb, sappy dude, and she says, and with an impudent face, she said to him, I have peace offerings with me. Today I've paid my vows. Come on, honey, let's go. And, and, and is it fascinating to you, because it is to me, that, that the whole idea of this callous conscience be that of the people of Israel in Exodus, uh, be that of Ahaz in 2 Kings or in Proverbs with this woman. It just seems like they can do whatever they want and still think God's okay with it. And I have to ask this as we get ready for the text. Is there any part of us that's like that? <clears throat> there are part of us that thinks, wow, I could just do whatever and God's going to forgive me anyway. So we're cool, right, God? Well, God is not cool with being hurt like anyone would be in a relationship where you care, where you could care less about an individual's feelings, knowing that there are certain things that just crush the heart of them. God would say this to give you an idea in Amos 5.22. It says, though you offer me burnt offerings and green offerings, I will not accept them, nor will I regard your fatted peace offerings. He's like, don't pretend that I'm just going to accept it because you offer it when your heart has no interest to me in the first place. Well, with that in mind, <coughs> um, let's dig into our text. And our text is really, it kind of just goes into just a few really quick uh, sections so they're fairly easy, and let's see if I can do this right. Here we go. Our first five verses. When a sacrifice is a sacrifice of peace offering, and again, that's what we're talking about here. And he offers it uh, of the herd, whether that, and that's uh, the idea of an oxen, uh, whether that be male or female or a heifer. He shall offer it without blemish before the Lord. He shall lay his hand on the head of the offering and kill it before the door of the tabernacle of meeting. Oh, I'm sorry. There we go. And Aaron's sons, the priests, shall sprinkle the blood all around the altar. And then he shall offer from the sacrifice of the peace offering an offering made by fire to the Lord. And then we get into this list. The fat that covers the entrails and all the fat that is on the entrails and the two kidneys and the fat that is on them by the flanks and the fatty lobe attached to the liver above the kidneys. Uh, he shall remove and Aaron's sons shall burn it on the altar upon the burnt sacrifice which is on the wood that is on the fire as an offering made by fire, a sweet aroma to the Lord. In our first set of verses here, we have the idea if you're going to offer your ox. And please remember, this is a volition offering. This is not a required offering. This is an offering you give because you just want to give it. And the idea of giving an ox is the idea of giving a work truck today to God because that's the idea. Uh, interesting, the idea that a male or a female could be offered, that's in Leviticus 3.1. But I do find interesting in verse 2 that real peace requires death. And by the way, notice it says it's at the door of the tabernacle of meeting. In other words, it dies so that I can enter into this peace. Peace requires death. And by the way, we can play that in a lot of ways, but I'll just kind of lay out a couple things for your consideration. The first is in the area of forgiveness. 
Uh, we have somebody, they've offended us. We feel we have a right to hold that grudge. We feel we have a right to kind of look at them cross-eyed. And, and, and in that, we're punishing ourselves. We're killing that relationship. But we know that if we really want this relationship to be right, something inside of me has to die. The thing that has to die is that sin of pride, of self-righteousness, of self-exaltation to say, I have a right to be spiteful in this situation. And yet, when that thing dies like it should, I can have a right relationship here, which is so much more valuable than anything I could possibly hold on to. Well, you take it and notice again, sin is the aspect that has to ultimately die. That You lay your hands on the head of the offering, you kill it at the door, and of course the idea of that is I am transferring something upon myself onto this animal, and this innocent animal is dying in my place. Kill it at the door of the tabernacle of meeting, and Aaron's sons, the priests, again take the blood, and it falls to the ground to cover the cursed ground. And then we read about the innards. Now, in Leviticus chapter 7, what we're going to see are the innards, in the simplest sense, are offered to the Lord. The shoulder and the ribs are heave offerings, and then they're given to the priests. And the rest, by the way, is actually eaten by the sacrificer himself. We can see that all the way back in Exodus 29, 28, for instance. And that's, that's important to know because this is an interesting offering because though I offer it, I'm offering it, the part that God just tells me you shouldn't just be eating this anyways, that part goes to him. A part that sort of some of the nice cuts go to the priest is a, is a, a heave offering, and we'll talk about that at a latter time, the idea of praise. And then in that, the rest of it, I get to eat with, with those of my family or and or uh, those if there's a situation where the piece is more horizontal than vertical. In other words... This peace offering doesn't, though first and foremost, it's the issue of I have peace with God. And therefore, because I have peace with God, I want to make this offering. But this offering can be offered if I had a lack of peace with my neighbor next door. And we've had some issue. His dog keeps pooping up my yard. He's staying awake at night, playing whatever kind of music I'm not fond of. Whatever those things are that create, you know, the kind of weird situations. And by the way, those are all at random. I'm actually really good with my neighbors, just so you know. Uh, and with all of that, Somewhere in all of it, you finally made peace. You made peace with each other. And then what you do is you go to the priest, you offer this animal together. And then with that, you uh, give the parts that you shouldn't eat to God, that only Scots eat, uh, which is only ironic because my next door neighbor is a Scot. And uh, then you take the other parts, you bless the priest because our unity blesses that. But then we eat together because that is the perfect symbol of unity is the idea of us being able to enjoy a feast together. And that's why what we're going to see even with this is this is one of the where you're going to see something you just don't see elsewhere. And that's the idea that you're giving food to God. And you're like, well, what in the world does that mean? We'll get there in a moment, but it's under this theme. So it's important to note that as we sort of see this list uh, starting in verse three, that there's going to be uh, this aspect of, you know, uh, it's, it's going to bless a lot of people is the idea. So look at it again, verse three, this says, you shall offer from the sacrifice of the peace offering an offering made by fire to the Lord. And this is what we're offering to God now. This is his portion, the fat that covers the entrails, the fat that's on the entrails. Um, and it says the two kidneys and the fat that's on the flanks, the fatty lobe attached to the liver above the kidneys, he shall remove. And then it says that Aaron and his son shall burn it on the altar. It's a burnt sacrifice which is on the wood, again, on the fire, uh, as an offering made by fire, sweet aroma to the Lord. Now, that term fat, by the way, is going to be used in one manner or another 16 times in this chapter. And it's not a long chapter, so I think that that's kind of noteworthy. But the, the valuable thing, first and foremost, is that this is the innards you're offering to God. Now, why is that so important? Because that's the part God's looking at anyways as our offering, if we really want peace with him. Uh, in 1 Samuel 16, 7, and some of you probably think, oh, of course he's going to go there. As Samuel is picking Saul's replacement and he sees David's older brothers, and he goes, ah, oh, clearly that guy, look at that guy. And God says, don't look at his outer appearance or his physical stature, because I've refused him. He says, the Lord doesn't see as man sees. He says, a man looks at the outer appearance. We judge things by what we see in the outside. He goes, but the Lord looks at the... And we usually, the word is translated heart, but the term is love or levav. And levav means the innards. 
God looks at the inside, and that's where he's making his judgment calls. And what God is telling us here is, this peace comes when the inside of me is the part that's actually offered to God, if you will. Because remember, I've laid my hands on this animal, and this animal now is acting in my stead. So the insides are given to God because I will never have peace with God if what I do is my outer appearance seems to be surrendered, but my inner appearance just is not. So in all of that, I'm offering all of this uh, fat to God. And, and, and I love the fact that God's like, you know, that's actually my part. You really, you really don't need that part. So then we move on to the second part of those. So that's what we do if we have an ox. Now, on the other side of that, what happens if we have uh, something of the flock? Well, the overarching verse is verse 6. It says, and if his offering is a sacrifice of peace offering of the flock of the, to the Lord of the flock, whether male or female, there it is again, he shall offer it without blemish. Now, notice, by the way, again, there's no great peace offering with God if what you're going to do is just offer God your sort of stanky, ranky, old things that are going to die anyways. So he's going to go into that the two things to finish up the chapter. The, the issue of a lamb and the issue of a goat. So uh, look at the one of the lamb starting in verse 7. If he offers a lamb as his offering, well, then he shall offer it before the Lord. And he shall lay his hand on the head of his offering. Does that sound familiar? And he will kill it before the tabernacle of meeting. And Aaron's son shall sprinkle the blood all around the altar. By the way, interesting, it does say... Um, that he shall do so before the tabernacle of meeting, but it doesn't say before the door, although I think it's implied. Uh, these shall offer from the sacrifice of the peace offering an offering made by fire to the Lord. Same items, if you will, but in uh, but these phrases are in different places in the texts. Uh, it's fat, and the whole fat, which is um, of the fat tail. Now that's going to be unique to the to the lamb here in this. Uh, the fat tail shall remove close to the backbone. So really, there will be no tail left. Is the idea of this? And the fat that covers the entrails and all the fat that's on the entrails. And the two kidneys and the fat that's on them, that should sound familiar. And by the flanks, the fatty lobe attached to the liver and above the kidneys, he shall remove and the priest shall burn them on the altar as food and offering made by fire to the Lord. Now we have this offering that is um, the offering of a lamb. And just like the other, it needs to be perfect. Because you're laying your hands on it, this perfect thing's dying in your stead. Uh, and in that, the interesting, the unique thing in all of this, of course, is this idea of, of exposing the backbone and removing the tail. And the idea of the way that this is done by slicing into it and then pulling it's with the idea, it, it just looks a lot as I've seen it done. It looks like scourging. And I think it's interesting that the one thing that seems to receive that happens to be the lamb. And so here I am, I'm laying my hands on this animal. This innocent animal is dying in my stead. There should be no person who has an understanding of the Old Testament that cannot grasp that God has laid out for us as a foundational paradigm, the idea of a substitutionary sacrifice, because it's right here in front of us. All of these animals are our substitute in our stead, dying in lieu of us. And we get it. And so with it, you're given all that fat stuff again before God. And then it says, you know, uh, look at, again at verse 11. I'm going to get back there so you can see it again. It says, and the priest shall burn them on the altar as food. Now that's a unique thing. An offering made by fire to the Lord. Now, this is so beautifully rich, the more we understand at least a little bit of the cultural implication of this. And that is that, like with my neighbor or with somebody else that you, your boss, your worker, whatever, your, whoever you're with, that you're now at peace with, you eat together so that you both share of the same thing. And what you have then the term for sharing of something in common is communion. You have communion with this individual that you were that you were once not at peace with or even at enmity with, but now you're at peace with and now you have communion. And how do you have that communion together? You eat together. So God didn't have to do this, but he did. Isn't it beautiful? God didn't have to say, burn this stuff and I'm going to call it my food. 
but he does so so that we could recognize that when we were offering this, God is feasting with us so that we have more than just some form of, you know, if you will, articulated restoration or reconciliation. We have communion with each other. And that is brilliant. And oh, what a great God that would offer this offering and place within it the idea that he desires communion, even in uh, our being the offender. If you think about it, we're the ones who really have to make right in this situation. God hasn't done anything wrong. Our last few verses. And if his offerings of a goat, well, then he should offer it before the Lord. And he shall lay his hand on the head and kill it before the altar of the tabernacle of meeting. That should sound familiar. Um, I'm sorry, he should kill it before the tabernacle of meeting. And the sons of Aaron shall sprinkle its blood all around the altar. Again, the blood flows and it lands upon the cursed ground around us. And he shall offer from it his offering as an offering made by fire to the Lord. The fat that covers the entrails and the fat that's on its entrails, the two kidneys and the fat that's on them uh, by, the fl by the flanks, of course. The fatty lobe attacked, attached to the river. <laughs> Did I just say that? The fatty lobe attached to the liver. Uh, yeah, you can see God uses the foolish things of the world to confound the wise. Above the kidneys, he shall remove. And the priest shall burn them on the altar as food, an offering made by fire, a sweet aroma. All the fat is the Lord's. And then he says in our last verse of this, this is a perpetual statute throughout your generations in all your dwellings. You shall eat neither fat nor blood. In our verses again, with our last situation, now with the goats, notice again, the fat is given to God. But he also says in our last verses of that again, that the priest in verse 16 shall offer as food. God's like, I want fellowship with you. I've paid the price. I've set up a substitutionary sacrifice so that you can... Confess your sins upon this, and in dying in your stead, we could be right with each other, so we could feast together in communion. And then he says in verse 17, and I'll put that up one more time, he says, this shall be a perpetual statute. Let this be something that as long as there's going to be Jews on earth, let this be something you guys do. Let this be a testimony for eternity, because the idea of something perpetual is that it doesn't end. Let this testimony that takes place here be something that testifies of not just this moment, but of something eternal and everlasting, because the ultimate restoration of God, the ultimate peace with God, the ultimate feast that comes from that peace with God is everlasting and not just in this moment. So God says, so the fat, I'll take that. I don't want you guys chubby without needing it. And we're still learning what's in the fat that bothers us uh, and, is, and creates problems for us. But of course, he'll tell us ultimately that the life is in the blood and we'll get there shortly uh, when we actually dig into that text uh, in Leviticus, by the way. So God's going to make that clear. Now, <clears throat> In my last couple minutes, I want to be able to delineate a couple things here so we can go to prayer. And that is the difference of what God is offering initially, fundamentally, and foundationally, and then what is the result of it. The thing that God offers first is peace with God. And then the well here, let me just let me develop that. Isaiah 57, 21 tells us that there is no peace, says my God, for the wicked. And no matter how far you run from God, no matter where you run from God, you will never find peace there because your soul, that innards, will never have peace until they belong to Him. He tells us, on the other hand, where that peace can ultimately come from and what it looks like. In Isaiah, again, 52, verse 7. So five chapters prior, he says, How beautiful upon the mountains are the feet of him who brings good news, who proclaims peace. Now, how does he do it? He brings glad tidings of good things, proclaiming, same word there, salvation, who says to Zion, 
your God reigns. Now, classic literature, Hebrew literature, puts things in parallel. He says something and says something again and replaces a word so that you know these two words are equal. And here he says, who proclaims peace, and then he says, who proclaims salvation. The peace that we need can only be found through salvation. And that salvation comes through a message of good news. And in the New Testament, that term is the gospel. As a matter of fact, that term, if you will, with that good tidings and glad, or glad tidings and good things is the same uh, theme that we get when the angel speaks in Luke chapter 2, verse 14, at the birth of Jesus, when he says, when the angels sing, glory or say, glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace, goodwill toward men. I bring you glad tidings of great The same statement is made. So when I see this peace that comes through salvation, the angel says, remember that Isaiah 52, 7 text? Well, that's what I'm talking about here, proclaiming Jesus' birth. And I get it because in Matthew 1, 21, it tells us she shall bring forth a son and you shall call his name Jesus for he shall save his people. And what's that salvation? He shall save his people from their sins. So let me put these equations together and I'll get to the other aspect of this. There is no peace outside of God not the peace that God speaks of, because peace is a relational thing and not just an experiential thing. And he says, there's no peace there, but I'm going to give you that peace, and that peace comes through salvation. And then he tells us that salvation comes through Jesus. Then, to, to conclude that aspect, Acts chapter 13, verse 38, let it be known to you, brethren, that through this man is preached to you, speaking of Jesus, the forgiveness of sins. That's how Jesus is offering us that salvation. What's my response? It says, and by him, everyone who believes is justified from the things in which you could not be justified by the law of Moses. So put this with me. We start off unjustified. In other words, our accounts do not reconcile with the God to whom we must settle accounts. And with that, my guilt, my iniquity separates me from God. And God says, I will give you peace with me, but I'm going to give it to you through this means. And just like in the peace offering, an innocent being dies in my place in lieu of me. And I have to be willing to transfer myself upon him so that I could say, you are dying for me. And what it tells us is, is that Jesus' death on the cross is the ultimate eternal satisfaction that only what we see in Leviticus 3 presented is done in a temporary means of, I'm going to get peace with God. I seek peace with God. There's that total surrender of a burnt sacrifice and the peace offering of an animal dying in my stead and his blood falling to the ground. So the idea that preached is the forgiveness of sins through the gift of Jesus on the cross my responsibility is to trust that, to put my trust upon what Jesus has done. That's called believing. And therefore, the result is that I would be justified from all the things which I couldn't be justified by the law of Moses. Paul would develop that by saying in Romans 5.1, therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. You want peace, you get it by being justified. And that justification comes through Jesus Christ. If you've never accepted the gift of Jesus Christ, I'm going to give you that shot here in just a moment. It comes, again, everyone who believes, everyone who puts their trust upon this gift that Jesus gave us at the cross is justified from all the things we couldn't be justified from in the law of Moses. Here's the great news. Once I have peace with God, Part of the benefit package is now I have the peace of God. In Philippians 4, 6, Paul would write, Be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your request be made known to God, and the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. The power in this is, now I have a God I'm right with. I have peace with it. Because I have peace with God, I can take all of my anxieties, 
all of my fears, all of my trepidations, and I can cast them before him because I know we're right. We're right because Jesus paid that price. So I cast all those before him and his peace, God's peace, the peace of God, well, actually, that is beyond my understanding. It isn't like God's like, well, I'm just going to give you some understanding and then you'll have peace with the situation. But rather, God's like, I'm going to give you a peace that even if you never understand on earth what's going on here, you could still have peace. Isn't it great news that I don't have to understand to have the peace of God? And that peace will not only be granted to me, but according to this verse, will guard my heart and my mind through Christ Jesus. So that my heart could be guarded by that peace. My mind could be guarded by that peace, even in the face of this rough situation, whatever it be. As a matter of fact, so much so that in Colossians 3.15, Paul would say, let the peace of God rule your heart. Let it now have dominion over you, to which you were also called in one body and be thankful. As we go to prayer, let me ask you, where are you at with this today? Because he is the God of peace. Romans 15, 33 makes that clear. In the kingdom of God, it isn't about eating and drinking, which by the way, even in regards to the issues of, of uh, conditions and convictions, even here we see it's about eating uh, this, this feast offering, this, this peace offering, but he says it's really not fundamentally about that. That's just, if you will, the, the archetypes. It's the emblems. He goes, but it's about righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. Now, there's only two groups we fit in right now. There are those that have peace with God through the gift of Jesus Christ being justified and trusting in him. And there are those who don't have that peace. And if you don't have that peace with God, you won't have that peace with uh, of God because how could you get something of God if you don't even have peace with the person who's offering it? So I want to give prayer and offer that for each of us now. First, if you've never accepted this gift, Jesus' death on the cross for your sins and mine, his burial so that it could be left for good, his resurrection so we could have a new life no longer under the tyranny and despotism of that of that uh, sin and that iniquity. And with that, we can have peace with God. And then with that, once we've prayed that prayer, we'll segue then right into, God, I need the peace that is not to be in conjunction with my understanding, though I could understand and I'm good with that. But I need a peace that isn't reliant on my understanding. And, and whatever our situations are, we could have peace. But maybe part of that is God's telling you tonight, you know, that neighbor, that person, that whatever, you need to go make peace with them. You need to, you need to let it die. Well, shall we pray? God in heaven, I thank you for this beautiful text. I thank you for what you've walked us through and all the scriptures and all the things that work its way together with it. And my humble prayer now, Lord, is for every one of us that first we would have peace with you. And so, Lord, if there be any right now that hearing my voice have not accepted the gift of Jesus, then right now they've, they've had no peace. They may have had sedation and distraction and diversion, but they've had no peace. And Lord, show them that you're offering them that now. And if that's you and you want to you put your trust upon this work of Jesus, if tonight you want to receive this gift, pray this with me right now. God in heaven, I confess to you, I need your peace. And I recognize it only comes through the gift that you gave me where your innocent son died in my place. And right now, just like with the peace offering, I lay my hands upon his head. I say that I gladly put myself there and say, Jesus, thank you for dying for me on that cross that all of my, the crimes of my heart could be punished. And Father, just like you said in your scriptures, he was buried, he rose again. And now you offer me the opportunity to trust that work done for me, and I say yes. Confessing Jesus as my savior, because he's clearly my savior, and my ransom, and my Lord, I'm yours now. So have me in Jesus' name. And if you agree, 
I ask you to say amen. And Lord, for every one of us who have said yes to you, be that for the first time tonight or whenever prior, Lord, let us be people of peace. As your wisdom is sown in peace by those who make peace, and you've told us blessed are the peacemakers, God, make us people of peace. And first and foremost, may we have right peace with you. And in that, may we have uh, your peace, the peace of you, ruling our hearts so that we could ultimately have peace with others, so that ultimately we could seek for others to come to know this God of peace. So tonight, Lord, whatever be the problem, the trial, whatever be the thing that is the anxiety in our hands, we lay them at your feet as you've told us to, and may your peace take its place in its stead. In Jesus' name, amen. Beloved, thank you for the privilege of this time with you. Thank you for the opportunity to serve you for another day. Read ahead. Chapter four is next, and I'm super excited to see what God's gonna do with that. If you need any prayer, if you've prayed to receive Jesus, get a hold of us here, and I'll look forward to seeing you next week. God willing, with guitar in hand. God bless you, my friends. Thank you for the privilege of another Sunday night thrive with you.